Greetings and welcome to another edition of the Big D Podcast. Before I announce today's special guests from the UK, uh, please subscribe, like, share to the Spunky Spectrum Sports YouTube page where you can see all my latest and greatest interviews. Uh, we've got not just this one, we've got Olympic swimmers and, and an NFL free agency uh, preview show coming. <laughs> I've, wa- I've always wanted to interview a British runner. Well, today I've got the chance. Joining us from Cambridge, England, is a silver medalist at the recent European Indoor Championships in the 1500 meters, Holly Archer. Holly, uh, how's Cambridge? Hi, what an intro. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, Cambridge is good. Um, it's cold as usual, rainy, but uh, nope, it's all good, fresh from. Poland from the indoor championships. Was it any warmer in uh, Poland? No, it was actually colder in Poland. It was snowing while we were there, in fact. <laughs> <laughs> just be Good glad thing you, it was indoors. <laughs> just be glad you didn't have an outdoor meet in Turin, right? Yeah, I was, I was glad. Just wondering, just, uh, hopefully we don't have any of the uh, cold, te- well, I doubt we'll have any cold temperatures in Tokyo, right? No, I know. I don't, I don't think we'll have any issues with that. Uh, yeah, so Holly is a uh, middle distance runner who uh, specialized in what, the uh, 1500 and the 5K, right? Yeah, I'd say so. Uh, middle distance, 800 here and there, but mostly 15. <laughs> yeah, so what, do you uh, remember the first time you actually tried running? <laughs> um yes I do I actually started running when I was maybe 11 and um it was actually a school cross country race um and we would just kind of run round our round up come off of our school run around a neighborhood and then come back onto the field um and we did a cross country with the guys and the girls and I remember I came fourth with everybody um so I beat majority of the boys and one of the boys said that I cheated but I didn't so I remember I telling my dad after that moment that I want to start and go to a club and train um so the next time I did it which was like the next month um I came second and the the teacher didn't tell me off because he knew I'd been training so yep I remember the first time I ran uh do you remember the first pair of running shoes you wore Oh gosh, no, I think they might have been even plimp soles. <laughs> no, no alpha flies there, that's for sure. So, uh, in, in your younger days, were you always a runner or did you try multiple sports? No, I think when, when you're a kid, you're encouraged, especially when you go to your local club, to try a bit of everything. So, I remember doing a bit of hurdles, long jump, um, sprinting. Um, and I only used to train really like once a week and just just had fun with it for the first couple of years. I don't think I really started training for running in particular until I was around 14. Did you have any running role models you followed? Um, yeah, some big running role models in the UK um, that I had back then were the, the likes of Kelly Holmes. She was a double Olympic champion for Great Britain. Um, she did the 815 double, um, I think it was 2004, um, Athens. Um, and so yeah, she was a big inspiration when I was growing up. So yeah. Uh, being in Great Britain, uh, did was 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 there any pressure to like be a runner oh not at all no not at all i mean um i feel like you can have more pressure in the u.s having been in the u.s system as well i went to school in dallas texas at smu and i learned that the cultures are very different and the scholarships are pressuring to get a full ride whereas in the uk running is you know, you, you can be the best runner there is and you wouldn't get a scholarship to a school. A school is based upon, you know, everyone, there's no scholarship available for anybody. Everyone's kind of equal in that respect. So you just pay, everyone pays their, their dues, as we say. 
but in the US, I feel like it's more of a, a pressure to perform harder at a younger age in order to get a scholarship, um, in order to be successful. Um, so yeah, no, there, there wasn't really any pressure in the UK. Yeah, so um, obviously when uh, obviously when London hosts in the 2012 Olympics, there were big, big cheers every time a British athlete won. Uh, did, do you remember any specific uh, track and field events from the London Games? Yeah, yeah, I went. I was at, I went to the London London Olympics um, to spectate in 2012, and I just remember Jessica Ennis. She was like our golden girl um, back then. And obviously she was competing over two days. So she, one of the days that I was there, she was competing. Um, and yeah, it was pretty, it was the Friday. So it was the day before the Saturday, which when all the finals were in the head, but she was doing the 200 and the long jump. And it was, yeah, it was really interesting to see her compete live. Yeah, I, I can't imagine a heptathlete or the decathlete doing seven or 10 events because the... The last events always the oldest one, whether it be the 800 for the women or the 1500 for the men. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's the, the final one where they know what they've got to do. Yeah, and they've got to run, what, five seconds faster than the previous best time? Exactly. Yeah, just a small ask. <laughs> So could you talk about your early running successes? Obviously, uh, in your young days, you talked about finishing second in your local meet, but uh, what about your local success before college? Uh, yeah, I mean, I didn't really have much success before going to the US. Um, I think I was a fairly mediocre runner, I think it's fair to say. Um, good, good enough to get a full scholarship, obviously, to the US, but um, nothing, I didn't do anything crazy. I didn't win everything. I didn't make finals or, or anything like that. I think the US is where I started to blossom and started to train harder. And then when I came back, that's when um, I'm now in full-time employment, but uh, I've just been training even harder um, and I got myself in a good situation with a with a coach and, and a group that, that's helping push me. Well, speaking of college, uh, you went to Southern Methodist University in Dallas. Why SMU? Um, I don't know. I just really got on with the coaches there. Um, I like the program and I like their uh, educational program that they had to offer. Um, I like Dallas as a city. Um, they had a good conference. Um, so, yeah, no, I, I went there and really enjoyed it there so yep yeah could you talk about could you talk about some of your running adventures especially those uh, american athletic uh, conference meets yeah yeah we we went to the armory mostly for our co our final conference uh, championships um but then the last couple of years we went to the Birmingham Crossflex and yeah, it was, I was always aiming for, you know, a medal when it came for a conference or whether that was gold on my last year, but I got a bronze a few times, silver a few times, but the girls that were in the conference, they're still running, all went pro or somewhere about. It's Anne-Marie Blaney. She's, um, she's pro in the US. So she was in our conference, Emily Durgan. She's pro for Under Armour in the US. So these are the girls that were in my conference. So it's, it's, it's good to know that our conference was so strong in depth those years. Yeah, it's interesting because when you think of top conferences in the US, you think of the SEC, the Pac-12, some of those mountain conferences, particularly in the uh, distance meets, whether it be uh, BYU, Colorado, some of those um, – mountain schools but it's showing that depth can be can be found anywhere yeah exactly so um yeah it had, had a really strong conference um i don't know if it, it's still as strong right now but i know the years that we were there like the, the group of girls we had all pushing each other have, have all gone to be really successful so yeah now as you know Doping has been a big issue in track and field for decades. And now I'm not sure how much of it you saw in college, but whether in college or as a pro, have you seen 
instances where somebody may have been cheating, whether it be using, whether doping or with using these super athletic vapor fly or specially designed shoes. I mean, I haven't been, I haven't, I can't say I know anybody that's been doping personally. Um, I, I know it's happened in the past, but I'd like to say that the testing has got better and um, it's made it more difficult for people to, to do it. Um, so can't say I know anyone personally, but um, yes, it probably will happen and we'll probably find out about it in the next 10 years time, unfortunately, because that's just how the system works. But uh, yeah. Now, what about with uh, shoes? I mean, have you always have you fell at a disadvantage with uh, your shoe choice at major events? Um, yes and no. I mean, obviously, I'm not sponsored, so you know, I can wear whatever shoes that I I feel like I want to wear. Um, I think the the shoe situation is helpful for longer events because you know over the course of a marathon if the shoe is helping five or three seconds per mile it's not going to make a huge issue for a mile race i mean yes a few seconds um but over the course of a marathon it turns into a few minutes so i can see i can see the debate stronger for the longer events so over a 10k for example on a track it could be um, yeah, it, seconds lead up to minutes, right? So, um, but in terms of my events, the eight and the 15, it's marginal um, in terms of, um, you know, progression there. So I don't feel like it's a, I'm at a huge disadvantage. And I think the other brands are doing a good job to, to keep up. But at the end of the day, that's been this scenario for years. Like, way back when yes the records are going to keep getting broken um with the new advances in technology but that's a given given you know time is going to do that anyway with different there's been other things that we're doing now that we couldn't do then also you know so uh like we we're more aware of altitude training which may not have been a a factor 20 30 years ago so there's different things that we're also developing and that's just down to evolution yeah it seems like everybody seems like a, no matter if it's the 400 meter hurdles 815 or 5k it seems like everybody's getting faster right yeah it does it does feel like that yeah so uh, obviously since co this time last year we're all dealing with the impacts of COVID-19 and so uh, how strange change for you um, yeah, it's been difficult traveling, um, quarantining and, you know, getting to races. Like when we were in Europeans right now, we had to, you know, get to the, uh, the, we were in a bubble, so we weren't allowed to leave our hotel or our, the bus or the facility. Um, and we got tested on arrival and it took four hours and then we got tested on our departure so we were thoroughly tested and, you know, you couldn't go out for an easy jog outside your hotel, for example. You're very much in a bubble. So it prevents you from other things that you wouldn't even consider. Like, you know, you couldn't go to a supermarket and get your cereal bars that you usually eat before a race. Or you couldn't go for a shakeout jog in the morning of your race. So you had to be very careful about, you know, leaving um, the facility and then you've also got flying and doing all the forms and preparing for it. These are extra stresses, extra steps, extra things that you have to do just to travel. So, yeah, it's been a bit more complex, but I'm glad that we're finally getting a process in doing so, so we can still compete. Yeah, obviously, yeah, it was weird seeing a big indoor meet because everybody's been so scared of having an indoor race. I mean, the U.S. and not the uh, NCAA championships, but the in, in but the U.S. indoor championship meet was canceled. Yeah. Here, but yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, how many race? But uh, how often have you been able to race? Obviously, you're racing two and a week and a half ago. But how long have you? Been yeah. I've only managed to do. I only managed to do two races before the Europeans. 
So usually I would like to do, you know, three or four races before a major championship, but I only was able to do two. Um, and those both two races were limited to only six people per race. So they were small, small races. Um, and then I did the heat and final, obviously, at, at the championship. So I've done four this year. Um, and considering we're now mid-March, I mean, that's not as many as I would usually do, but it's been enough to to still race well, I guess, off of it. <laughs> well, uh, speaking of Trevin, I think it's about time we talk about your meet because, uh, <laughs> my golly, uh, I think, uh, I don't know if you were the star or the talking point in the meet, getting that silver <laughs> medal in the 15. Yeah, the yeah, it was a little messy, huh? <laughs> little messy and a controversy because you got second but were disqualified for bumping another runner i mean were you worried that you broke any rules i mean yes i was disqualified for rule 17.2.2 which was jostling so a lot of people thought that i was disqualified for going on the inside of somebody but there was actually quite a lot of room on the inside when they reviewed the video so I was then, so then they did a counter appeal and I was then DQ'd for jostling, which was basically, you know, pushing or, you know, pushing somebody. But then, you know, no, when I finished that race, I shook my head um, straight as soon as I finished because I knew it was a messy race. And while I was running the race, I was actually in the back for the majority. I didn't get to the front till the last two laps and being at the back, I was actually avoiding all the jostling, but when somebody goes to the front and puts their brakes on, my hand is gonna gonna go on the back of somebody because you know if you're in a car and someone puts their brakes on in front of you and you go into the back of them, that's just that's just how it works, right? So um, I won the appeal on the basis that you know you, the person in front slowed down, which is why I went into the back of them. So. Yeah, I, would, I looked back and I think everybody could have been DQ'd on the terms of that race. It was, it was chaotic. Everybody pushed, everybody shoved. Um, but that's also indoor racing. That, that's, especially in the 15, it's not like the 8. In the 800, you can, everyone runs quick, um, pretty much from the go. But, and you also have less people, you have six. But it, in the 15, you have far more people and it just becomes a bit more tactical. So, I mean, I didn't think I should have been DQ'd when I came off, but I wasn't surprised because I think everybody would have been DQ'd um, if you were to go back and look at how many people pushed. Yeah, one of the things about middle distance running is that it's not a question of if, it's a question of when somebody makes contact and race and these races often don't turn into speed first i mean knock on wood the 2019 worlds look like a sprint 1500 yeah. race look like a sprint race yeah it did <laughs> so congrats on your uh, silver men and would you uh finally relieved on being on it being reinstated as the silver medalist yeah i mean i was I was relieved of obviously being reinstated. It was a few hours that I had to wait um, to find out. But I was, you know, I was prepared to not be reinstated. And, and I was happy with even if I hadn't got the medal because the way I raced, I was happy that, you know, I was in a bad spot the whole way around. In fact, I was probably in the worst place possible the whole way around. And I still managed to go from sixth to second in the last lap which shows that I have strength and the ability to make a wrong into a right, um, which not everybody could do. So, um, yeah, no, I'm happy with the way I race, regardless of getting the, with the silver or, or not. Yeah, so it's not just showing you've got a finishing kick, but that your, your train is working well and that no matter what's happening around, around you, you've, you're in control of your destiny. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, because not everybody can get themselves out of a tight spot, right? You have to, you have to maneuver yourself, and you have to have that want. You can't give up. So yeah, I'm happy that I I didn't give up, and I still managed to have the maybe the fastest last lap. So uh, 
what's a normal training week for you? Um, so it varies depending on like having a race coming up or not. Obviously, before races, like the training tends to be a lot easier, the mileage a lot lower, um, a lot more strides rather than sessions. And um, but right now it's back to base work, so it consists of usually two sessions a week, one more volume and the other more intervals. So you know, tempo and some long intervals. Um, and then a long run and the rest of the week would be an easy, easy just runs. Um, and then when we're leading up to a race, those sessions turn into more intense, um, shorter intervals. So your threes, your twos um, with, with short recovery and long recovery and a bit of play on speed rather than um, endurance. So I'll start to pick up the, the pace come three or four weeks closer to a race. So what's a normal mileage week for you? Um, probably around 65 miles a week. Yeah. Is that, is that usually on the road or a variation of road and track? Yeah, I try and get off the road as much as possible. Um, depends where I am. So I usually go to Flagstaff, Arizona a lot. Well, I went there in January and I plan on going there in April. Um, so at the end of this month. And that tends to be a lot of dirt running for your easy runs, um, which is good. So, and then if sessions, if they're, if they're intervals, I tend to do it on the road. Um, and then the other session on the track. But uh, while I'm home right now, there's not much like dirt track. So it has to go all on the road. But um, I find running on the road harder on your legs. Um, the impact, it just takes my legs longer to recover like the next day. So if I'm on a dirt road, it doesn't feel as sore as it would the next day if I had have gone on the dirt. So I think definitely running on dirt's better. Yeah. Are there any advantages to training in Great Britain? Um, not really. <laughs> a lot of people, we don't have any where to go to altitude here, uh, being a small island. Um, so, you know, you, you can go to altitude in Europe, um, which is the same as probably traveling in the U.S. because Europe's probably similar size in terms of size to the U.S. So a few hours, you can go to Switzerland, um, which is a really nice place to train for altitude. Um, you can go to south of France, uh, which people usually go to, which is, you know, a place in Europe that you can get within a couple of hours. So there are options to stay in Europe, but I genuinely like the US um, because they also have great races available. Um, and just everyone seems, the weather seems to be a little lot better than it is in Europe. So um, in terms of the time of the month, so April is definitely worth going to, going to, to the US. Yeah, a little drier and a little drier and a little warmer here compared to Europe where, uh, yeah, you exactly. The, you don't know what the weather is in uh, with the Alps. It could be 70 and beautiful or 30 and snowing. Yeah, you, you don't know what you're going to get. <laughs> so uh, if uh, Tokyo can successfully, hopefully, knock, uh, knock on wood, host this mm -hmm. year's Olympics, uh, who do you see as big threats in your race? Uh, uh, will you try and make the GBL team of the eight, 15, or some combination? Yeah, I'd be trying to make it in the 15. Um, obviously, I have some big threats in that. I have Laura Muir. I have Gemma Riki, who may do the eight. I don't know, but our 800-meter girls are really strong at the moment. So I'm banking on that she does the 15. But then I think it's anyone's game after, the, like, after those two. We obviously have three spots. So... Um, there's a few other girls that have run faster than me, but not recently. So in terms of recent success, I think I'm like up there and have a good chance to go. Um, I just need to make sure I get myself out to training and I stay healthy and maybe try and get funded. Um, if I can get funded, I can not work as much and therefore train a little more. So the plan is to try and get some sort of sponsor or funding in the next couple of weeks so I can keep, you know, training at the same level as my competitors. Yeah, I think I think of the Great Britain not just eight but fifteen hundred meter squads as deep, deep, deep. And uh, Laura Mir is definitely a medal contender. 
yeah exactly she will she's got pretty much every uh, medal but an olympic one so i'm pretty sure that's um her her goal and she'll be throwing everything at it so she would be definitely a hard one to beat this year i mean uh I mean, we're almost middle than Doha coming back on that dreaded calf injury, which is probably the most annoying injury you could get, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so uh, obviously outside of Great Britain, who do you see as a big threat in the 15? Obviously, Stefan Hassan will be numero uno, depending on what event, and we'll sell yep. events she runs. Yeah, exactly. I'm not sure on her train and I know she's had a shift in coaches and, and stuff since her success in 2019. But, um, you know, the US is always is always on fire. You've got El Puria, you've got uh, Shelby. They're always, you know, they're already ready to go. Um, but you also have a few, you know, a few Kenyans and Ethiopians that, that, that show up on the day that will, will also be tough. But but for me, my goal is to just make the Olympics. I think that would be a huge success for me. Um, um, so, yeah, that's, that's strike one for me, I think. Yeah, just making the Olympic team and just making the Olympic team and racing in front of a, well, I don't know if it'd be a full stadium this year would be. Yeah, who knows, yeah. So what are your 2021 racing plans? Um, so far, my racing plans are to to race in LA and uh, the um, sound running event um, on the 15th of May. Um, but there are, have been a lot more developments in racing in the US. I've seen that, you know, the USA track and field have put on quite a few. Um, they've put races in Kansas, there's races all over the place going ahead. So I don't know what ones I will do yet, but I do know I'll do some around the US in May and then head back to the UK for the trials in June. Oh, uh, the US, the UK trials will be in Birmingham, I'm guessing? Usually it is, but the stadium is actually under construction right now because um, of the Commonwealths in 2022. So they're creating a whole new stadium just for that. So actually it'll be in Manchester. Uh, will it, which stadium will host that, the Etihad, I'm guessing, or will it be a different? Yes, exactly. Yeah, the Etihad. That's really good knowledge from you. I'm a, I'm a Premier I'm a Premier not, <laughs> <I'm a laughs> not, Premier League not, trust me, I know what happened yesterday and with the North London Derby and, um, Manchester, Manchester United being West Ham, trust me, I know. <laughs> so what's your career running? So what's your career running goal? To make the Olympics, I think. Um, I think that's the biggest one, um, which means it will lie in the next couple of months. So, yeah, I'm throwing everything at it um, and seeing, seeing if I can make it in the next few months. But, I mean, that's the biggest one. I think you can't really top that. So, yeah. So uh, my last question is for Ron. We know eating. We know eating's a major habit, whether it's before, during, or after a big meet. What's your, what are your last meals the night before and the morning of a big race? See, I'm not really, um, I'm not really like I don't have to eat the same thing or I don't have like a meal that I particularly eat. But I kind of like to just the night before just stick to carbs and, and um, you know, safe foods, if you will. So just, you know, rice or pasta and, you know, chicken or some sort of meat, nothing too outrageous. And then I work backwards on the day of a race and usually it's oats, banana, um, maybe a cliff bar a um, few hours before I race. So, you know, I have oats in the main meal about four hours before and then I'll just snack on a bar and a banana on the few hours leading up um but yeah it all depends on when the time the race is it could be at five o'clock it could be at 9 p.m it could be 11 a.m so i just tend to work backwards on hours and and just keep um the fuel just really easily absorbed um and nothing too too difficult to digest Seems like everybody likes bananas the morning in a race. I mean, I ran a 5K this past weekend in Florida, and uh, I eat bananas <laughs> with my cereal. Yeah, I mean, it's just easily, 
you can it's it's quick release energy your your body doesn't have to work too hard to you're not going to get an upset stomach from it so it's safe it's safe in that respect yeah you imagine a banana if banana if a banana gave you that extra half second you need to make the olympics yeah it could you never know so we wish you all the best in this year and hopefully we'll see you at the uh, Tokyo Olympics. Thank you and thank you for your time.